Well, the Lal Street sees red as the markets end at a three-month low. BSE companies wipe out a market cap of nearly 11 lakh crore rupees in the last two sessions. The Sensex and the Nifty fell 2% to post its biggest weekly fall in a single month. And banks took it on the chin, fell over 5% this week. And this was on a truncated week, by the way. It was, there's so much happening. It's complete chaos. And today's edition of the Editor's Roundtable, we will decode the fall in the Adani Group stocks, which was the big talking point of the street. We also put a spotlight on similar and auto stocks. By the way, auto stocks were big gainers. And we analyze a SEBI study which says that nine of ten, nine out of ten traders lose money in FNO transactions. I'm Sonia Shanoi, and it's a full house today here. We have Prashant, Anuj, Nigel, Nimesh, and of course our special guest uh, for the show, Gautam Dugar, is also joining us. Gautam, thanks for being with us on the show. But folks, um, this was a week we thought we could relax. You know, it was a truncated week. But hey, guess what? Bang! And the market decided not to oblige, right? You know, before you guys start about markets down, this, that, the other. I want to say <laughs> a positive, optimistic thing. Out of a holiday, into a holiday, right? <laughs> so I think we can, we can use that as a buffer and then discuss markets, right? And I think uh, I'll latch on to one positivity which came out of this week, uh, which was Pathan. And I think uh, the way, uh, you know... Uh, and Did you watch it? I, I'll watch it this weekend. I could not yesterday because uh, I wanted to, but I'll watch it this weekend. And, uh, you know, uh, for two reasons. Obviously, I'm a diehard Shah Rukh Khan fan and I think as I've been saying is the only true superstar and B I mean it also proved that if content is there then all these boycott calls and all they don't work mm. and the content has to be there you know that was one thing which was missing with the film industry I think that I'm glad that they've realized it and now you know started to see at least some good blockbusters coming out okay Gautam you want to pipe in did you watch Pathan you like no, movies not yet, not yet. <laughs> you're watching busy watching the markets and all that happened today right, this week I'm right 50 companies a day so <laughs> result season is going on anyway exactly. we are now but how did you feel about the whole market fall and this whole Adani group fall I mean what's your you know what's been your takeaway from that so I think market fall uh, in a way it lightens up the uh, positions. We've gotten a bit complacent last year because mm -hmm. India outperformed by uh, 25 odd percent. Uh, on its own, India was not expensive to begin with. Even at 18,400, you were trading at 18 and a half, 19 times, uh, one year forward, which is bang in line with long period average. Now at 17,500, there is a room for an upside because now you trade at 17, 17 and a half times. So far, earnings season is in line. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some downside risks which are always there. Consumption sector has been uh, slowing down. The results from the consumption sector have been very weak. Banking has been a bright uh, spot so far in the result season. IT, while everybody expected that sector will disappoint, but sector has stood quite well in terms of performance. Couple of companies upgraded their guidances. And rest of the uh, cyclical pack is yet to uh, post numbers. I think even Reliance uh, was a big, uh, big beat, at least on our estimates. So numbers have, uh, while some sectors have shown a bit of a weakness, but by and large, on an aggregate, numbers have been pretty good. Mm -hmm. And the fact that markets have corrected to an extent, whatever, 500, 800 basis po uh, 800 points on Nifty, it makes the valuation a little lighter now, mm -hmm. at about 17 and a half, 18 times. So, uh, till about a month back, we were trading at emerging market. When you compare MSCI India versus MSCI emerging market. Now, that would have come down a little bit. We were at peak trading at 160% premium in October. So, a lot of that premium has been shaved off. It is still at a premium. Our long period average is 65-70%. Uh, that I think India deserves. But in the last 12 months, when the rest of the market corrected, this premium had exploded. Okay. But Anand, you know, that, that brings us to the point of what happened this week, right? I mean, of course, there are big events upon us. There's the union budget, there's the FOMC meeting. But this week, the market broke the lower end of the mm. trading range. How important is that? And do you think that could, you know, pave the way for more downsides, perhaps? Yeah, you know, and uh, just to extend the point that Gautam made, and look, India is always expensive. You know, I always say that Indian market is like Malabar Hill property. You'll always get it expensive. You'll never get it cheap, right? So, it's just a question of how much more expensive. Look, on the market, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think three or four weeks back, I'd spoken about 20 DMA halt, uh, whether that conf gets confirmed or not. I think that's got brutally confirmed now. Now, what I'm watching out for is the 200-day moving average. Uh, because, you know, just like bad news came in at the 20-day moving average, I won't be surprised if good news comes in at 200-day moving average. And that's why I give so much importance to these price levels. Uh, now, what are those levels to watch out for? On the Nifty, we are now just 1.5% away. Actually, maybe slightly more because in the last hour, there was a bit of a bounce, which I may not have captured in my graphics. But let's say 2% away from the 200-day moving average. The bank Nifty is 3.7% away from the 200-day moving average. But I tell you what, the two leaders of the market, 
ICICI Bank and State Bank of India, which led the Nifty and the Bank Nifty all through last year, they are already at the 200-day moving average. So if they are there, then I think it's a matter of when and not if Nifty also goes there uh, and tests it, uh, even if it's uh, successful or not. Uh, now, there are some indices which I'm looking at in terms of uh, the 200-day moving average cushion. The mid-cap index, by the way, is already at 200-day moving average. We discussed Bank Nifty is about 3.7% of 200-day moving average. Nifty IT is still about 2% about 200-day moving average. Then the three indices that I'm keeping an eye on, which have had a big rally. And I think that's something that you've got to keep an eye on. Nifty Metals, by the way, China opens up on Monday, and that could be a big trade. 7.5% of its 200-day moving average. FMCG and Auto, they're still about 45 to 5% about the 200-day moving average. But if you look at the stocks, and that is where the problem is, the big stocks of the market are at or below the 200-day moving average. ICICI Bank is at 200-day moving average. SBI is at 200-day moving average. Infosys is at 200-day moving average. TCS is just 0.5% uh, higher than 200-day moving average. And one thing which we haven't spoken about or haven't given enough importance is very quietly Reliance has broken down. I, you know, actually that's one thing which has really impacted the market sentiment. Reliance is 9% below its 200-day moving average. So going forward, I'm keeping an eye on three stocks, Reliance, ICICI Bank and SBI because they need to bounce. Uh, they were the stocks which led the market rally last year and all these three stocks have now fallen 15 to 20%. Their combined weight on the index is more than 25%. And, uh, you know, with the kind of fall that they have seen, that's really impacting the market. So I'll keep an eye on this and, of course, the 200-day moving average. But uh, the big uh, talking point was the Adani Group stocks, where there was quite a bit of selling pressure for two days in a row. And Nimesh is going to tell us uh, what exactly happened over there. Nimesh? Hi, you know, there is massive sell-off in, uh, in the Adani Group stocks. I'm no saying that there was panic selling. Uh, not only in the market, but in the, in the overall Anani, Anani Group stocks as well. But, you know, while we all are talking about panic selling and all, the fact is there are some important, uh, you know, fundamental data to track for all the group stocks of Adani Group. So, let me start with Ambuja Cement first. Uh, the stock, uh, you know, closed around the 385, 389 levels, but internally the stock fell below the 385, the open offer price at which Adani is bought from Wholesale and made an open offer. In fact, it hit a low of 350 uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle trade. And the other important point is uh, the promoters are infusing money in, in Adani's, uh, in Ambuja cement at a price of 418 rupees. It's, it's through a preferential warrants. Similar is the case with ACC as well. Intraday the stock at a low of 1850, closed around 1900 levels, but the open offer price of ACC from, uh, from the Adani family was at 2300 rupees per share. So again, there is a deep discount now to the open offer price at which uh, the Adani is bought over. And remember, both these assets are strong assets backed by cash flow. And there is a sector tailwind as well as far as the cement sector is concerned. Similar is the case with Adani Ports. Uh, look at the stock price today. It, it hit a low of 550, you know, recovered towards 600 levels in the, in, in the, towards the closing end. But uh, Kotak put out a note today uh, in, in the morning. They have they've updated the stock to a buy now from ad and they have a target price of 860. After, the, after today's fall, the stock is now currently valued at less than 11 times FI24 EV2 EBITDA. And this is again a, a monopoly company having a 50% market share having a margins of more than 60-65% and the stock has collapsed to uh, almost 10 times forward earnings. Uh, last is uh, Adani Enterprise. Now, this is going to be very critical. Uh, the stock today slipped below the, uh, below the FPO price. The FPO price band is between 3112 to 3276. And the anchor investors came in at the upper end and they've committed 6,000 crores, which means half of the money, 3,000 crores, will come through the anchor investors. Now, the critical point is uh, the FPO ends on 31st of this month. Now, the key to watch would be at least one time the QIP book has, has to subscribe and overall 90% of the book has to, has to subscribe for the issue to go through. So that will be very important and could be a near-term catalyst for, for not only for RN Enterprise, but for the entire group as well. So while there is panic selling, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, triggers, go, I mean, a lot of uh, panic selling, I mean, there, there was a lot of retail got, got, got cleaned out, mm. but there are some fundamental things to watch for as far as the Adani groups are concerned. Uh, Gautam, uh, your view on this, especially the way banks sold off uh, this week, uh, uh, and uh, you know there was all kind of debate on whether uh, the Indian banks actually deserve to fall that much. Do they actually have that much exposure to Adani? I mean, that aside, your view. So Anuj, uh, when such a big event happens, typically fundamentals take a backseat and sentiment, you know, drives exactly. the market. I think that is what has happened today. If you go by the data which is available in the public domain, the entire banking sector exposure, wh whichever way you slice and dice it, private banks or PSU bank is less than one percent. In fact, less than 0.5 percent. And if you uh, look at it as a percentage of network, that is also sub-2 or sub-3%. What market was perhaps looking at is, was an excuse to sell banks. Because you've seen it in the last 10 days, every single bank has posted solid set of numbers. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them have seen an upgrade. 
Uh, we have seen this in second quarter FY23 also. Banks have been posting very good set of numbers, but the stocks have not been reacting. Mm. Perhaps people are trying to shift some allocation because bank is an overwhelmed sector today. Every fund, every investor is, uh, it's become a consensus overweight kind of a call. Is there an argument that for banks, the best of the quarter is, is, is now behind and from year and you're going to see name pressures and you know, any special as well. So is, is that something good market is telling you that the best for the banks is over? Possibly the best is in, but okay. it's not yet behind. Okay. I would expect banks to do very well even in FY24, hmm. notwithstanding this NIM pressure. Look at it, uh, uh, Limesh. FY18 to FY23, banking sector in Nifty, if you add up the 11 financials, they've gone from 45,000 crores of profit to 2,8,000 crores of profit. Yeah. That is a massive 5x jump in profit in five years. Hmm. In that same five-year period, your auto profits have gone down from 30 to 20,000 crores. Hmm. Now, on that high base, banks are expected to do about 16-17% growth, which one can debate that it's much lesser than what people have got used to in the last 2-3 years, sure. but it is still very healthy. Okay. Well, you know, let's talk about another pocket which did well, right? We're talking about all the gloom and doom, but on the flip side, there were some sectors that did very well and autos topped the charts. So the big headlines this week was very good numbers that came in from the auto pack, whether it was Tata Motors that reported uh, profitability for the first time in two years. It was Bajaj Auto that reported a record high EBITDA. There was TVS Motor that posted a fifth consecutive quarter of margins plus 10% and Maruti where the margins went up both year on year and quarter on quarter. Now, if you look at the stock moves as well, right? January has been a very good month for autos so far. Tata Motors is up 15%, Bajaj Auto is up 10%. In fact, m and is now up 80% from the lows that it saw in March of last year. And there are a lot of positive triggers as we know, whether it's the pickup in demand, whether it's supply side challenges receding, or even raw material prices are lower. But the question we're asking is, is there more valuation headroom? And if yes, which are the stocks that have headroom? Now, if you look at the chart that will come up for you on your screen, uh, Bajaj Auto, Maruti, TVS Motor and m and now, most of these stocks are trading, uh, you know, around their historic averages. So, let's just get you that list. But Maruti and TVS Motor have more valuation headroom compared to historic averages. So, Maruti currently trades at 24 times FY24, while the historic average PE is 26 times, while TVS Motor trades at about 26 times, while historic average PE is 27, 28 times. A lot of brokerages have gone ahead and upgraded the stocks this week as well. Uh, JP Morgan upgraded Bajaj Auto. UBS raised their target price on Maruti to 12. 1600 and Jeffries raised it to about 1550 on TVS Motor. So across the board, brokerage upgrades. But from the entire list, there's Maruti and TVS Motor that has some valuation headroom as per historic averages. But the other sector that we looked at uh, towards late trade uh, in the week was cement, and there was quite a bit of a fall there. Well, that's right, Sonia. Moving from the best performing sector to actually <laughs> one of the worst performing. So cement really had a down week, actually. Uh, you know, if you look at it, and in terms of uh, the numbers of Altotech, well, they were pretty much in line. The issue was, you know, the stock opened up mildly in the red, but post the con call, the stock fell. You know, it fell closer to around 4% also. So a few takeaways, let's start with the positive part first. <laughs> the demand, as they said, is rock solid. is likely to continue in the coming year. So good news out there. And on pricing, though, they were not committal. They said that, in fact, you know, pricing could remain a little bit flattish, which the street is working with price increase coming about. So that was something that they didn't indicate, and the street was clearly disappointed. But still, they said that the EBITDA from around 900 rupees will move to four digits. That means more than 1,000 rupees. How does that happen? They indicated operating leverage will play out. So that's something that uh, they, they are working with. And also the cost per ton of fuel, that's going to come down by around $25 per ton. That works out to roughly around 120 rupees. So the broad sense you got is operating leverage is what they're focusing on, not on pricing, which the street got a little bit disappointed on. The overall cost over the sector, they expect it to remain elevated because China is reopening. There's no fresh pet coke capacity that's coming on stream. And also that ongoing war between Russia as well as Ukraine. Finally, they're saying, yes, we're sticking to this CAPEX, 6 to 7,000 crores odd. So suddenly you have Altitech, the biggest player out there, which is going to be aggressive. The problem is we're getting to election year, and past evidence suggests that when you get into election year, volumes pick up, capacity utilization picks up as well. In 2015 and 2019 as well, you had volumes that were very, very good. And the takeaway that Jeffrey says is, in FY19, Volumes went up by 12%, but EBITDA went down by closer to 100 rupees. And that's the fear getting into an election year. Will FY24 be a repeat of FY19? Well, the bullish sentiment on the street says no, but that's a data point that we need to contend it as well. Before we wind up, just a valuation snapshot. A couple of the stocks in there, they have come down, whether it's Ramco or Shri, they have derated over the last few years. 
but otherwise the others are trading pretty much in line with their averages. Okay, in fact we want to pose these questions to Gautam as well but we need to take a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere, we'll continue to decode the wheat gone by and also tell you about the big queues that are lined up in the week to come. Stay tuned. Editor's Roundtable on CNBC TV 18. Well, you know, we've been talking about uh, the kind of exposure that the Adani Group has on several banks. It has been on the lower side. But let me bring in Ritu Singh now, who has the exclusive response coming in from SBI on the Adani stock route on the back of the Hindenburg report. The bank has said that SBI's exposure to Adani Group is well below the large exposure framework of the RBI. Ritu Singh gets us more on that. Ritu, over to you. Well, that's right, Sonia. SBI, one of the largest lenders to Adani Group, has just told us, and I'm quoting this verbatim uh, from the managing director in charge of corporate accounts at State Bank of India, who I just spoke with, who said, uh, you know, the group exposure for Adani Group is well within the large exposure framework limits, which is 25% of the bank's tier one capital. Secondly, all of the exposure of SBI is secured by cash generating assets, and any, uh, you know, acquisitions that the Adani Group may have may been, uh, been making is largely from overseas market borrowing. So there is very little exposure as far as the Indian banks are concerned. Secondly, and more importantly, the bank highlighted that the Indian bank's exposure to Adani Group has been declining over the past uh, two to three years, and that is a trend that we've been seeing as well. And at the same time, their debt to EBITDA has been improving as well, which improves their debt service obligations as well. Uh, as is known, uh, you know, there is the exposure build up to the, uh, you know, uh, Indian banking system on this account, therefore, has been low. Uh, SBI also so in the meantime, keeps reviewing the exposure to check whether there is the likelihood of any stress buildup over the next 12 months. And from those tests, SBI has been able to tell us that there is no concern on devolvement of Adani Group uh, loans. And if uh, you know any action is required, they will take time, you know, measures from time to time to ensure that uh, you know their exposure is safe. And as of now, no concern whatsoever on what uh, on their exposure to the Adana, uh, to the Adani Group. <clears throat> All right, uh, Ritu, thanks very much uh, for that. That's an important story which we will continue to track. Uh, Gautam Dugar, of course, is uh, still with us. Uh, Gautam, I, you know, away from all of this, uh, earnings are coming through. And you mentioned uh, a little bit about uh, the kind of earnings we're getting. I wanted your thoughts on Dixon, uh, which is, of course, well-tracked, institutionally owned stock. Uh, big cut after the earnings disappointment. A view on the stock and what do these earnings tell us about, I mean, the overall uh, sort of optimism about manufacturing in India because that was the poster boy, right? Yeah, so see, Dixon, we don't cover yet. Mm. Uh, I've seen the earnings. I think they've uh, lowered the guidance. I think the market reacted more to that because I remember at the beginning of the year, the guidance was 17, 18,000 crores of revenue. And then it was brought down to 14, 14,500. And I think now it is somewhere about 12,500. Particularly the mobile and consumer electronic segment is where they've seen a lot of uh, downside. And uh, obviously, stocks we've seen uh, across sectors, wherever the PEs are high. Right? If you check through the other consumption results also, I think bearing Hindustan Lever and some of the auto sector companies which have uh, posted good set of numbers, almost every single consumer company, especially on staples as well as on discretionary, uh, whoever has posted the results, they have disappointed on demand. Companies are reporting single-digit top-line growth for 4, 4, 5, 5 quarters consecutive basis. Uh, we've seen earnings cut of 10, 12%. Uh, big names uh, which have seen earnings decline for four five quarters in a row so maybe we are living through a consumption slowdown period right now uh, which has been ongoing for last two three quarters uh, exacerbated by what has happened in the rural india for last whatever eight nine months urban we had seen a big pent up after two years of pandemic in cy22 so this year urban should normalize and that's why uh, the hope from the budget is that the government will put some money in the hands of bottom of the pyramid uh, population because this year you are talking about eight very important state elections which then culminates into 2024 large one and this will be the last budget uh, full-fledged budget of this government so that is where uh, i think uh, budget comes uh, very handy but that aside high pe stocks where growth is not getting delivered guidances are getting cut uh, there is a clear reaction from the market and uh, dixon falls into that category absolutely well let's move on then a sebi study has revealed that uh, 
89% of traders in FNO lose money. The other way to look at it is 11% make money, which is higher than the strike rate in IIT entrance exam. So, <laughs> and if you want to look at things positively, but Prashant, you have all the details, right? I do. I mean, you know, we're uh, hearing from all influencers and uh, all kinds of influencers that trading is the way to go, right? And I think the SEBI report uh, gives us a reality check that it is not easy. Let me just uh, go across to the wall and tell you uh, what exactly the report says. Uh, so let me tell you what the scope of the report is. I mean, I'm calling it, does Satta make uh, money, right? And this is, of course, from no less than SEBI, uh, the market regulator. Uh, this is a 33-page report. They've analyzed p &L of individual traders. So this kind of excludes institutional traders, you know, uh, uh, pro uh, pro uh, prop books, etc. So this is individual traders. Uh, they've only looked at the FNO segment, uh, and uh, this is only for two years, uh, FI19 and FI22. One is pre-COVID year, the other is, I mean, FI22 means this is bulk of the year was 2021 calendar. Uh, this was, of course, still lockdown, Delta wave, etc. So people were stuck at home. I'll tell you why that is important. And they studied data from 10 brokers, which made up 67% of uh, the individual client level turnover during uh, FI22. So this is not 100% data. This represents 67% of the individual client, limit, uh, client level data. First is the number of individual traders, which has seen a big explosion. It was 7 lakh odd in FI19. In FI22, it went up to 45.2 lakh. And this is what I was talking about. 2021 was a COVID year. And trading volumes, not just in India, but around the world, zoomed up as be because people were stuck at home, could not step out. And uh, I mean, you know, trading was one of the things which uh, they engaged in. Age profile of traders also kind of uh, has just shifted. So between 20 and 40 age group, you know, in FI19, it made up for about uh, 55, 54% of the volumes, 55% of the volumes. That's moved up to almost 75% of the volumes in FI22, uh, right? Naturally, I mean, uh, people who were uh, going out to offices, there, they were stuck at home and uh, they also engaged in a fair bit of trading. Now we come to the statistic, which is basically the headline uh, of this piece. Uh, this is uh, their study in terms of how many people made money and how many lost. Simply put, 89% of those who, tra who traded lost money and 11% actually uh, were able to make a profit. What was the average profit and average loss? The, am the average loss was 1.1 lakh and the average profit was about 1.5 odd lakhs as well. Just a stunning statistics. The, the, Sebi, the study says the average loss of a loss maker was over 15 times the average profit of a profit maker. I mean, I thought uh, that was uh, kind of interesting to put out. What, what is the uh, sort of diff, uh, trading activity in options versus futures? The next graphic will tell you 98% uh, of the volume is now options. Futures, 11%. It's not very different from FI19. But if you go back 10 years, I mean, you go back to 2007, 2008, you know, it used to be reverse. 11% options, 90% futures. That's completely flipped. But of course, that's a slightly longer time period we're looking at. Tra transaction costs, I mean, something which people don't consider. And the SEBI study uh, says traders paid, uh, you know, 23, loss makers paid 23% of their net trading loss in transaction costs and the similar num numbers out, out, out there on the profit making side as well. So these are substantial transaction costs. I just want to end with a couple of points, which I think are, should be pretty obvious looking at the SEBI, uh, SEBI study. Making living by trading is, I mean, a tough, it's actually one of the toughest things out there. Uh, don't let what people and people, uh, people on social media, etc., tell you. It is a tough if you're looking to run your house uh, by, uh, by, by the trading income. Successful trading requires study, dedication, method, system, whichever works for you. It is not random. It is never random. Uh, and of course, it's, a lot of it is mental and behavioral, right? I mean, it requires you to overcome one's own biases uh, in a very large way, inherent biases and traits. I want to just end with what I think one of the greatest ever traders uh, has said. Ed Saikota is featured in the Market Wizards book. It's a book which you should read if you are planning into uh, getting into trading or if you've not read. He says it can be very expensive to try to convince the markets that you're right. And second, he says the elements of good trading are one, cut, cutting losses, two, cutting losses, three, cutting losses. If you follow these rules, you may have a chance to survive. I think, I mean, a pretty wise words from someone who's actually thought about this stuff in a pretty deep way. So that's a SEBI study for you. Back to you guys. Absolutely. You know, and just one last point. The study also says that the top 1% make 50% of the overall pool of profit and top 5 or 6% make 91%, which takes me back to the old classic of Ashok Kumar and Amol Palekar, Choti Si Baat, where he says that the bottom is always crowded, there's always space at the top. Uh, of course, uh, only 1% manage to reach the top, but if you do reach the top, 
then a lot of money is to be made there as well. Uh, and you know who's making all these monies, uh, by the way? Uh, that there's uh, Not as for sure. The HFTs, <laughs> the high-frequency trading firms. Yeah. Uh, you know, our colleague Santosh Nair had uh, made this beautiful report. Uh, yeah. The high-frequency trading firms are making money hand over fist, right? I just feel bad for that guy who, because you know... Because you take emotion out. Uh, no, I just feel bad for that guy who must have, you know, during the pandemic, maybe lost his job, mm -hmm. as you said, and started trading and then made all the losses. So, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Okay, well, folks, no, it's important. I mean, jokes apart, it's important to take all these uh, this caution on board. But hope you guys have a great restful weekend. With that, we wrap up with this edition of Editor's Roundtable. We'll see you again on Monday.